Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Rav Davidson. I'm thrilled to be here with my colleagues that will soon come on stage to talk about the adapted AI models for industry. AI is clearly all around us. It's transforming the way we consume and uh, generate content, the way we navigate in the world, both physically and uh, metaphorically. And it's changing our daily lives. It is also affecting the way we do our job in each and every industry and uh, across professions and, and roles. And we finally have the data to quantify the impact that it's making, saving us valuable time so we can provide a much better service and spend this time on bigger problems that need to be solved. And then there are some great examples there, such as Atrium Health, that is uh, saving doctors time, um, or the Stower Academy that is improving uh, reading skills, or uh, Rockwell that I think will soon show up on the screen, that is accelerating time to market with their uh, industrial automation uh, systems. And many more examples, here is Rockwell, many more examples to come. Through the engagements uh, we had with thousands of customers and partners, we identified four areas of uh, opportunity. First is the uh, employee experience. If I uh, think about security operations, they are now able to spend much less time chasing down incidents, and instead, they use this time to proactively prevent those. Second is the business processes. We literally have an, the opportunity to reinvent the way we operate. Third is customer and community engagement. This is becoming way more personalized and dynamic. And across all of these, we're actually unleashing the next wave of uh, innovation. One of my favorite examples is a supermarket chain from the Netherlands. Anyone here from the Netherlands? Okay, so I think it's called Albert Heijn, right? Is that the way to pronounce the name? Okay, so the J is not being pronounced. Okay, so the Albert Heijn supermarket chain, um, they, are, they are able to dynamically mark down the price of uh, food products as the food ages. So they don't only save uh, um, cost for the consumers, but they also significantly reduce food waste. How do we drive this impact uh, in the market? Let's see. First and foremost, it's the power of the Microsoft Cloud that enables our customers and partners to apply AI to the heart of their business in a secure and reliable way. This includes Azure, Fabric, Microsoft 365, D365, and more. On top of that, we, we provide industry-specific AI capabilities and domain expertise to optimize the solution for the unique requirement of each and every industry and use case within it. And the third part is the Microsoft Partner ecosystem. We work with our trusted partners, such as Fidelity and Siemens, that will soon be here on stage, Yay! That, uh, that bring their deep industry expertise, and together we build solutions that are relevant and prioritized for the unique needs of their industry customers. And through this partnership, we make sure that our technology is cutting edge, effective, and practical. This is our blueprint for success, combining the MS Cloud the um, industry insights and the partner expertise to, to allow our customers to embed in AI to their core business processes. And today, we are taking it to the next level with our um, adapted AI models for industry. These are built with our partners, we co-developed them to address top industry tasks. They are pre-trained and fine-tuned with industry data so we can ensure that the accuracy and effectiveness uh, is there to address the specific needs uh, of those industries. And before we dive into that uh, further, I think that some of you may be wondering, 
why do we actually need adapted models? Because I think we all agree that the general model is extremely powerful. However, it doesn't necessarily have the domain-specific knowledge and the precision level required to address specialized industries, such as financial services, healthcare, and manufacturing, and to handle nuances in those, such as industry regulations, terminology, or very specific workflows. The way I like to think about it, if I needed help with my medical insurance, I would want an agent with deep expertise in that very specific domain, but I wouldn't care much if they were also knowledgeable in art history. And I definitely wouldn't be willing to pay more for that. So we need to provide deep expertise in a specific domain in a performant and cost-effective way. And this is what we're able to do with the adapted uh, industry models. And to talk more about how we do it, I would like to invite to stage Pavandip Kalra. He's our CTO and the uh, GM of Applied Science. Pavandip, the stage is yours. Thank you, Mirav. All right, so let's take a little bit of a deeper look into the um, adapted AI models and <clears throat> how we are really actually going forward and doing this. So first of all, you know, we are a platform company um, and we are building a stack which basically makes it really easy for you to create custom co-pilots and agents. And you know, if you look at the stack, a key component of that is the foundational model, of course, because foundational model powers the intelligence in those custom co-pilots or agents. And for the last one year or two years, you know, I think what's become um, pretty apparent is you know, a, a lot, the foundational model, of course, is not trained on your specific data. So the way you try to bring intelligence to your data, I uh, think with techniques like RAG, retrieval augmented generation, right? Um, and these techniques are very powerful. They bring specifically your proprietary data into the, uh, into the ability for foundational model to give responses to you. Um, now, RAG works really well for real-time scenarios where you want to bring in real-time data to, to the foundation model. But it has some limitations. Um, one of the limitations is that, as the name suggests, it's a retrieval augmented generation. If the retrieval portion of the external database that you're hooking up into it doesn't give you the right uh, uh, data back, the generational portion of the foundation model is not gonna work very well. So those, are some of, you know, so those are some of the limitations that you sometimes run into with RAG. Additionally, RAG doesn't deeply understand the data or doesn't really have the knowledge baked into the model. It's really bringing the, the information in real time to the model for contextualization. Um, so you know, when you look at really uh, very sophisticated industry use cases, you know, fine tuning or continued pre-training are, are uh, better techniques sometimes to actually uh, use in your specific scenarios. And in specific, you know, when you're looking at fine tuning or uh, you know, pre-training these models, the information or the knowledge that is uh, in your data gets incorporated into the model weights. And so the reasoning capability of these models become much better. So generally, you, know, you can use RAG, it works really well, um, but there may be scenarios where fine tuning and actually adding pre-training to your models is a more efficient mechanis mechanism. So you know, if you wanna look at you know, how should we create fine tuning or these pre-trained customized models, you know, I'm gonna walk through you guys through a little bit of a recipe of how we think about uh, creation of this. And we've done this internally with our own models as well as with a bunch of partner models. And so this is, you know, again, a little bit of a simplification, so don't necessarily take it as, you know, um, an exact specification, but I think it kind of gives you the flavor of, of what that is. So first of all, you have to start by picking a foundational model. So pick a foundational model that works really well for you. And, you know, there are SLMs and there are LLMs and there are different parameters on, on these models. So depending on the, the, the deployment specifics that you may have, you may pick one versus the other. Some models are open, some models are closed. So again, there's a, there's a little bit of a, a choice for you to actually go and pick the right foundational model that you need. Once you have a foundational model, you want to bring your proprietary data which is heavily curated in that particular industry to the foundation model. Let's take an example of a manufacturing factory line, for example. If you're doing a chemical process, there's a lot of potential data and proprietary as well actually in, in textbook quality data, which is around chemical processes. 
So you curate the data extremely heavily because that gives you an advantage when you're pre-training or fine-tuning these uh, models. Additionally, you know, each of these models gets used by some persona. Typically in a manufacturing setting, for example, there is an operator. They're gonna ask a question, there's gonna be a response that comes from it. So there is, there is a very specific set of questions that are gonna be asked in a factory line versus by a financial company versus a healthcare company. So you can tune the model on instruction sets. So you can heavily curate these instruction sets with you know, question and answers on very specific operator and persona types. Um, so that's the, that, those are the, the most basic ingredients that you need is to really make sure you have curated industry data sets. There can be proprietary data, open data, uh, and instruction sets, which are you know, kind of samples of these question and answers that you're gonna ask the model. Now, typically when you're training the model, it's not sufficient uh, to just have this from your proprietary data sources. Typically you don't have enough tokens to actually go and train the model, so you need to take advantages of synthetics. Um, synthetics is basically a way for you to think about creating very similar looking data, but in a fake way. Um, and there's many mechanisms nowadays to use LLMs to help you create synthetic data. And so, um, you know, one of the key uh, portion of the recipe and one of the uh, real sophistication that tends to happen is, well, how do you use this, uh, how do you really create the synthetic data that's at scale so you can actually go and train these models? So, you know, you go through this kind of process and there's a lot of papers which can walk you through how you do that. Finally, you have enough data, which is a combination of your proprietary data, open data, instruction sets, and synthetic data, that now you can actually go and train these models, either fine-tune the models or do continued pre-training of the models on top of your foundation models, and you get a version that's now adapted to your specific use case, and it typically can work better. I mean, there's no guarantee, but like, it can typically work better than a RAG process which doesn't understand the knowledge in a specific way and it's not incorporated into your model weights. And typically you don't use these models you know, in isolation, you typically tend to use these models in combination with RAG techniques. So now that once you have a model, you still are not done. You now need to also do an evaluation of these models on benchmarks that matter to you. So a lot of the benchmarks that exist out there are for LLMs on standard techniques. So like there is an MMLU which is focused around, you know, kind of general tasks that we typically benchmark on. But you, know, you don't have benchmarks on, let's say again, a factory line when you're doing troubleshooting. So in, when you fine tune or adapt a model, it's important to make sure that you're actually benchmarking on tasks that are really relevant for you. So that's again another step that needs to happen. And then finally, it's also important that we run responsible AI pipelines again on top of the model because again, you brought more data to the model. That means certain safeguards may need to be added in. So for example, if you've, again, trained a model for a factory line, um, it's possible now that the model is gonna recommend a change of a setting in a machine that is not good for operator safety. And so you need to make sure you are able to kind of catch those scenarios and resp run responsible AI pipelines on top of that. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of roughly the recipe. Again, a little bit of an oversimplification, but kind of hopefully that th this gives you a little bit of a color of how you approach uh, creation of you know, adaptations of models. So with that, I'm really pleased that you know, yesterday uh, Satya announced uh, you know, the introduction of 20 plus industry models. Um, they will be coming in to um, our Azure AI Foundry model catalog. So these models are there, you can go in and actually um, find one that is relevant for your particular industry and you can you know, reach out to those model vendors if you're interested in using them uh, for licensing and so on. These models will also be uh, integrated into model co uh, uh, Microsoft's Copilot Studio, which means you can use this model to create custom copilots and agents, uh, you know, and, 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 and make it much more specific to your particular scenario. With that, I'm really pleased to welcome uh, Val Harard, who is the CEO of Cypher, to talk more about some of the Cypher models that we are bringing into the model catalog. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hi, uh, my name is Val Harad, and I'm the CEO of uh, Safer.ai. Uh, Safer is a company that uh, is incubated at Fidelity Labs, and Fidelity Labs is the uh, innovation hub for Fidelity Investments. Uh, before I get started, uh, how many of you here, when you are writing, you use a grammar check? What if I were to tell you that we can take laws that are written to protect consumers and use that so that when AI is generating content, we can ensure that it follows those rules. 
That is what Safer solves. By doing this, we allow adoption of AI in the financial services industry to spread. Let me tell you how we do this. As I mentioned, we are part of uh, Fidelity Investments, and all, the mission of the lab is to actually create new businesses, whether that's a SaaS business or a financial business, we are charged with, those, with the responsibility of creating new category defining businesses for Fidelity Investments. In the case of Safer, if you give us a document, the simple problem that we are trying to solve is whether or not we can find potentially things that are non-compliant with industry rules. As many of you know, when you get something from your bank or a financial institution, uh, there's a lot of, for example, disclosures in the back of that. Imagine that you have the capability, while you are creating that content, to have an AI assistant or a co-pilot, you might say, give you suggestions in terms of which disclosures that you need to put in that document. That's one of the capabilities that we have. And so as I mentioned before, give us a document, uh, and I'm defining a document uh, in the broadest sense possible here. So a document might contain images. So you might think, uh, for example, if you're in financial services and you uh, writing content about a certificate of deposit that has a very low return, and you have an image of a $200 million yacht. From a financial compliance standpoint, that may be non-compliant because it may be suggestive of an investment that's gonna have a high return, but yet it's giving the illusion by investing in it, you can afford to buy that yacht. Maybe you can, maybe you can't, but through that investment in that context, that's potentially non-compliant. So we are able to detect images and alert you that that image is potentially non-compliant. You can also pass videos into this capability. We will extract the content of that video. We will analyze it and we will tell you that at frame 205, let's say for example, someone said something that's potentially non-compliant. Because again, in financial services industry, if uh, you're speaking with your investment advisor, for example, and that call is being recorded, they cannot say something that's potentially non-compliant uh, to industry rules uh, to you. And so across these documents, we, we use uh, large language models. We use uh, uh, models that we've specifically built small language models, to not only detect instances where something may be non-compliant, but also to help you rewrite it in a compliant way. So we have a compliant suggested language model that if we find something that doesn't adhere to, let's say, for example, uh, FINRA rules or SEC rules uh, under the US regulatory regime, that will make suggestions to you in terms of how you can make that language compliant. So my analogy with respect to grammar check, one of the things that we'd like to say is that safer is grammar check for compliance. What allows us to do this? As most of you and all of you probably in the audience know is that data quality results in higher quality models. And I would say that uh, Microsoft uh, family of uh, Phi 3 models is a perfect example of that. If you use textbook quality data, you can actually outperform some of these large language models on some specific task. So if you were to take that uh, line of thought and apply it to the safer use case, given the fact that Fidelity is a fairly broadly diversified financial services company, so the corpus of data that we had access to that was curated by compliance officers, provided a uh, rich tapestry, if you will, that we could draw on in building these models. But above and beyond that, we are also incorporating uh, enforcement actions, because typically, when there is an infraction in the industry, and in, uh, FINRA or the SEC or some other regulatory body that do an investigation, and then, uh, 
typically at the back end of that investigative work is a uh, document that calls out the very specific infractions that they are finding the company for. So we consume that data as well. And then like uh, most people who are building uh, very specific small language models, we do a lot of data curation. We do some synthetic data generation as well. But uh, on our team, we have compliance officers. We have uh, former attorneys who used to work at some of those governmental agencies who help us uh, create and enrich the data. So that's what's allowing us to, to do this kind of work. As Pravin mentioned uh, earlier, uh, as part of the partnership that Satya announced, we are making four of those models available in the Azure model catalog. So uh, we are making the image detection model available. We are also making the language suggestion model available. The risk detection capability, we're making that available uh, as well, if you will. And we do have future plans working in cooperation with Prevenzip and his team uh, to make additional models available over time uh, as well. As I mentioned before, we're addressing a very specific need within financial services. Whether you are a commercial bank, a fintech company, for example, building an app that is servicing the financial services industry where you are creating content, maybe you're using a large language model to help create content. We can curate that content and help make it more compliant. You can use this QR code to get in touch with us, but above and beyond that, uh, I'm gonna talk very quickly about, uh, show you rather, uh, a quick demo uh, that we have about the product. And as you might imagine, given the sort of problem that we are solving here, there are a number of other industries where you have similar kinds of regulations. Uh, so pharma comes to mind, for example, where you can't just go out there and make a claim that is misleading just as you can't make a claim about a financial product that is misleading. You cannot exaggerate. So uh, our intent is eventually to cover other industries, but we are starting in financial services uh, because that's where we have the largest corpus of high quality, what I would call textbook data to address uh, this kind of problem. I ask you to bear with me because last night when we were trying this, we had a couple of difficulties with the video, but hopefully uh, that will start uh, running uh, a little bit. But uh, I think what we have on screen uh, now uh, illustrates one of the things that I mentioned. So this is the kind of image that if that appeared in a financial services context that is potentially uh, non-compliant, uh, because it's suggesting that, okay, if you invest in this thing, your money is just gonna grow. But as we all know, investment products entail some level of risk. You hope that it goes up, and hopefully you've done your research and it will go up, but the potential for loss is also a, a possibility. And so uh, this illustration here is where we embedded uh, the capability in Microsoft Word, uh, again, Going back to the example of using a grammar check, except we're applying this in a uh, financial context where we can detect risk, we can make suggestions, but above and beyond that, the foot model, I mentioned the three, the foot model that we have is uh, an explanation because we know that in AI, one of the issues that uh, we are confronted with is explainability. So if I'm telling you that something is a potential risk, I need to be able to explain why is it that the model has reasoned out that this is according to the rules. So for example, in the US FINRA rule 2210, if you're an investment advisor, uh, you need to follow that rule or you need to follow SEC rule 482 or the new marketing rule from the SEC, right? So we can detect those instances explain to you why we think it's a potential risk, give you a way in which you can correct for that risk. And as I mentioned before, we have multimodal approach. So whether it's video, whether it's text, whether it's um, 
whether it's uh, images, we can de detect instances of non-compliance. Or else if you are using an AI model to generate the content, Safer can act as a compliance layer on top of the large language model so that the output of the large language model is compliant with industry rules. So with all of that said, uh, thank you, and I'll turn it over to Marav. Thanks. <clears throat> Yes, so uh, in terms of next step, but before I get to that point, I do need to call out the collaboration uh, with the Microsoft team. Uh, I think the work that we were able to do with Privin Zip and his team and the entire Microsoft uh, team, I see Jeremy here uh, in the audience. Uh, it was just an amazing collaboration. We worked very closely, uh, daily stand-ups, weekly meetings, and we were able to implement these models in uh, record time. Uh, as far as what the future holds, as I mentioned, uh, Safer's capabilities, it's multimodal. So we have uh, the ability for it to upload a video and find instances of non-compliance. Uh, one of the more um, useful use cases is we have a, a, a financial services company who's a client of ours, and they use uh, influencers to post short videos on TikTok. So now before an influencer post something on TikTok, they can upload it, find out instances where it's non-compliant, we make suggestions, they make the correction to the video, and then they can uh, upload it. And so as many of you know, uh, during the crypto, uh, well, crypto is still going, but a lot of people were out there promoting crypto in ways that are non-compliant with financial services industries. Now you have a way in which you could uh, check for that before something goes on social media. Um, and so uh, those are some of the additional capabilities. Um, we had originally thought about making 10 models available. We're making uh, four available now. The other six, we are planning on working with the team and making those available. And as I mentioned, uh, we are uh, intending on working on other industry sectors as well. Uh, so for example, I mentioned pharma. In pharma, you have very similar issues with the FD, uh, FDA. They have rules. Uh, the FTC as well. Uh, they have rules uh, for some over-the-counter uh, products uh, that you can buy at CVS and so on and so forth. All of the content that you see from those companies, the cost of complying with those regulations and the friction that's involved in the review process. So you might think, okay, someone in marketing creates the content. They send it to an SME who look at the content and then they send it to a compliance officer or else a lawyer to actually review it before they post it. With Safer, you can take about 70 to 80 percent of the friction out of that process. That's pretty amazing. Um, maybe in the audience, we have some people who are considering also taking this path of uh, adapted models. Uh, do you have any key learning that, uh, or word of advice? Yes. So uh, again, I'll go back to the top of what I mentioned earlier. I think data quality, making sure that you uh, spend as much time as most of you know if you work in data science, about 90% of the work that you do is in data, uh, is data work. Only about 10% of the work involves uh, actual model building. So I think that make, make sure that you have a rich, high quality data set, first and foremost. And certainly working uh, with the Microsoft team, uh, getting involved very early in the process. Um, in the case of Safer, some of the models we had already built in-house, so that helped the process. But certainly I think the Microsoft team have, uh, they've got a uh, process in place in terms of how to do the intake. So I think that kind of collaboration uh, and the fact that the Microsoft team had been working with other industry partners uh, in this kind of process. I think Safer was able to benefit <laughs> from that because we came in at the tail end of that process. And so I, I would say that understand the problem that you are trying to solve. Make sure that you have the data to actually solve the problem and be very task specific, right? In our case, it's a fairly simple thing that we are trying to do, but it's very complicated in the background. I have a compliance check for compliance. Uh, for, I have a compliance check similar to a grammar check. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
And with that, I would uh, like to invite Danny Seeking, Senior Director at Siemens, to talk about their adapted AI model, NXX, right? Then, okay. there you go. Okay, thank you, Marav. And uh, thank you to the whole Microsoft team for giving us this opportunity to showcase how we've been working together. All right, well, many people are familiar with the Siemens name from trains, factories, healthcare, energy. But I'm part of Siemens Digital Industry Software, which helps the most innovative companies on the planet turn their ideas into real products. So as you can see here, it spans a variety of different industries. We've got aerospace, we've got automotive, uh, we've got marine. Uh, you can see Formula One example as well. So uh, almost any kind of industry out there that's designing products is, is working with us. Now, as part of that, the, the Siemens software um, portfolio, we've got what we call the Accelerator as a Service platform. And it's really unmatched in its capability. It provides solutions for all aspects of the digital twin. So to put that in context, there's probably a great chance that the car you guys drove in to get here today, the device you're, you're working on right now and, and, and using in your hand, probably has a digital representation in the Accelerator platform. And that's what we call the digital twin. So by combining mechanical, electrical, and software, these digital twins represent all aspects of the physical product and can be simulated, manufactured, and then once they're manufactured, we can generate IoT data coming back, feed that back into the design, so you have this closed loop of analytics and physical product and, and digital, digital project working together. And I'm grateful for the partnership we've had with Microsoft, and that partnership's been going on for over 35 years helping us bring the suite of capability to our joint customers, including now on Azure. So there's a lot of different products that we have within the Accelerator platform. And so uh, one of those products is called NX, and I'm gonna be focusing on that for today's demonstration. And okay, what is NX? NX is a product engineering suite. It's a multidisciplinary engineering solution that helps customers create their digital twins. So I, asked, I, I talked about all the different kind of life cycle of the digital twin, but first you gotta start by creating that digital twin, and that's really where NX uh, excels here. And I'm happy to share that the cloud-based version of NX, called NXX, is now on Azure. So the last X stands for the fact that it's on the Accelerator as a service platform and it's all cloud-based. And what this does is it provides the breadth of engineering functionality we have in NX in a fully managed product with integrated data management and cloud-based collaboration tools. And it's all within a single scalable architecture for the small business, so you could just have a couple users uh, all the way up through the large enterprise that have a global deployment with more complicated uh, supply chains. And, and all of that can work here within uh, the NXX product. And with the upcoming release, we're introducing multimodal and gen AI tools with enterprise security in a way that's gonna work for our customers, and that's what we're gonna focus on, uh, that piece for today. So getting into generative AI, generative AI, here at Ignite, we've seen a lot of different industries, a lot of different companies, and, and what they're doing with, uh, with AI, and in, in particular with generative, generative AI. So in the engineering and manufacturing and design uh, area, we're no different. And so we're, we're getting a lot of input from industry analysts. I can see, you can see the quote up here. Um, we're doing a lot of work within our own products to, to show the, the productivity gains you can get. And we're hearing a lot from our customers as well. So this has been a big focus uh, for us. All right, so at Siemens, how are we actually leveraging AI? Now, we're not starting just right now. We've been working on this for many years, uh, and we've been introducing AI capabilities into our products. We've got dozens of AI products out there. There's some demonstrations that you could see at our booth if you guys go stop by. Um, but you know, with the emergence of large language models and now small language models, uh, as we go forward, we're really uh, categorizing our capability into these three different areas. So you can see first is analyze. So, and that's really about helping the user guide through tasks and gaining a deeper knowledge of their data. Second is optimize. And that's, that's all about making recommendations on the designs and really understanding how various different conditions or maybe sustainability metrics should be considered in the design and having the software help you do that. And third is generate, where the software starts producing content and not only predicts, but starts thinking like an engineer to accomplish more complex tasks. All right, and now to help execute on this AI journey, Siemens and Microsoft have partnered up to bring the Siemens Industrial Copilot 
that ecosystem to our products, powered by Azure. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show a video, and then uh, let, you, let the video play, and then we'll come back, and I'll, I'll describe a little bit about what we saw in that video. So now I'm going to show a little bit because the video went kind of fast. So I'm going to talk through some of the things and then talk about how we did that. So, so as we step through kind of what we saw, so first was some examples of analyze as I went through the three different categories. So in this case, the engineer is asking questions related to a process. In this case, body and white design. Do we have anybody from the automotive industry here that kind of understands how cars are built? Well, if you are, you'd know what the body and white design is, but maybe not everybody does. It's very industry specific. So it's something, in this case, it deals with the frame of the car. So it's the structural properties, right, how the styling works and all that. So this, in this case, you could ask it that question, and you'll get some detailed answers right back with some links within the response on, on exactly how that worked. Um, and so once they figured out how, how that process worked, then they can come in and say, all right, now I want to work on this specific part of the car. So, so what, do, what do I do with that? Well you might not know how to make something the work part. So you have a component, you have an assembly, which is the whole car. Now I want to drill into a specific part and start working on that. Now I can ask it a question and say, how do I do that? And, and, it, will, and it will give you the, the answer. So even though some of these things might be a little bit more simple to some users, they might be more advanced to other users, the point is we've got engineers that work on a variety of different disciplines all the time. And so what they do is they might transition from one discipline to another, so they kind of have to relearn that. And so instead of going back into documentation or asking somebody, you know, it's all about giving them the knowledge uh, and giving that available to the users right where they are. Okay, next is optimize. And so optimize, this is where the, the software really starts understanding more detail about the digital twin to help with further optimizations. In this case, the user may want to work on reducing some weight, maybe in a way that won't affect the structural properties of the car. So to do that, they'll have to know what materials are used in the car. So you can just ask it, OK, hey, uh, visually, can you give me a report on what are all the materials that show up in this car? Right? And based on that, we can, we can show you the report and, and provide that to the user. And so based on that, maybe they could do some optimization studies and say, all right, I need to understand what the sustainability impact is this. So I can maybe modify some materials to get a better, a better score and, and reduce my carbon footprint, right? That could be one. There's a bunch of other optimization capabilities that we could build in here in terms of optimizing the shape um, and, and doing things with running real-time simulations. So as we're modifying the design, there's optimizations coming in that are, that are resulting from that. So again, this is now starting to kind of understand the digital twin, understanding uh, what, what that product needs to, or how that product needs to be built. 
And all that leads to generate. And generate is where the engineer is able to give instructions based on changes that need to be made and then have the software understand how to do that. Okay, so in this case, we've got uh, the engineer found out that they want to make a change to the face of the outer border of that grill that needs to be a little thicker. So instead of trying to figure out how to, what the complex you know, set of commands are or you know, how the software, you know, to understand how the software works, the engineer knows what tasks they want to perform, so they just say that. So again, using, just using natural language, saying that the software is now going to execute that task. And then once they, once they do that, they might need to understand whether or not, or what they did will satisfy all the requirements of the design. So now they can generate all the compliance checks associated with that to make sure it, it all worked as, as they thought it should. And all this leads to a lot of, you know, way quicker iterations uh, and ultimately huge productivity gains. And so I, I think, you know, these type of workflows would take a lot longer to identify and perform, but with the industrial co-pilot, it's, we're, we're trying to make it simple here and showing some examples of that. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about how we did that. So kind of a look under the hood here. Um, so we started off with some RAG-based models. So I have indeed talked about a RAG and, and how that works. We've been working on that for the last 12 to 18 months. And that's been really useful to provide our best practices, documentation, that kind of stuff. But then you do kind of hit a wall on the usefulness of that. And then at that point, you need to start training your own model. And that's where we got to here with, with this uh, example. And so we trained our own model, it started with the foundation model, kind of following the same blueprint. And in this case, we picked the Phi 3 Mini, which has 3.8 billion parameters. And so with that, we started feeding it in hundreds of thousands of our Python-based auto tests and training it on our APIs. Um, and so with that, we we're able to, to, you can see from the, uh, the visual here, turn right from text, turn that into automatically generated Python code, that then uh, the software will start to understand. So really by combining the context of where, where the user is, the task they want to perform, and the ability to automatically generate that code, we're unlocking the power of AI and enhancing these engineering workflows. So not only does this give intelligent and accurate results, but it allows the AI to directly interact with that digital twin that I talked about earlier. So this makes the language models a lot more useful for us since now we're teaching it the language of engineering. And by partnering with Microsoft and leveraging the small language models, we're introducing generative AI built directly in our products in a way our customers can leverage with confidence and with security, ultimately helping our overall goal of turning innovation into real products. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna switch Murad back up. Then, All right. Um, so maybe we have time for one, for maybe quickly also okay. a word of advice from you for uh, coming so, out of this journey? Yeah, thank you. So word of advice. So we've been working with Microsoft for quite a while on this. And I think one of the key things is giving time uh, allocated to being able to iterate and train these models in a way that's going to give you the right amount of quality. So I mentioned we have hundreds of thousands of these, of these test cases and you know, things where we understand what the input is, we understand what the output is. So by, by training it on it, it doesn't mean that it's just going to work uh, right away. And particularly, we're a very graphical application, as you can see. So we've got graphics, we've got objects, you have to identify things, you have to make sure that, um, that the inputs that you have are going to be associated in context of, of getting the right result to the end. And what we found is that it wasn't going to be perfect right away. So we found out that some of our, cast, our, our input data needed to be changed and needed to be improved and, and iterated a little bit so that you know, that input source to train the model, and then we can start automating that, right? So building this pipeline of data that we can, we can get sourced to, going through kind of a, a smoothing process and making the data a little bit cleaner and then sending it into the model, we're able to get a lot better results. So those are some of the things I just, it, it just takes some time, right? So just having the foundation model and a whole bunch of data is not gonna give you exactly what you want. You really gotta work at it. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Marab. Thank you. So I hope you are as inspired as I am by the examples that uh, Val and uh, Danny showed and motivated to look into the opportunity within uh, your business and uh, with your customers. And we're here to help. We're actually investing in skilling, in helping with differentiation, with go-to-market, and uh, with expert help. So let us know what, uh, what you need. There are a few of our team members here also that you can chat with uh, uh, after the session. And, uh, 
And to hear more about our approach to agents and the adapted models, uh, we also have a session tomorrow that you are very welcome to join. I want to end by saying I truly believe that the industry-focused AI has the power to create magical experiences, to influence our companies, our communities, our countries, and uh, hopefully to make this world uh, a better place. Thank you. <laughs>